Welcome. This is the eighth and final of the Archaeology Cafe events this year, and all of them have been uh, digital or, or uh, Zoom conferences, and it's been an opportunity to share uh, what our staff and their, their colleagues have been doing uh, over the last years or uh, recent time to implement our archaeology, uh, preservation archaeology mission. And the headquarters of Archaeology Southwest are in downtown Tucson, Arizona. And all three of us are down here tonight uh, on the ancestral lands of the Ton Autumn uh, Nation. Uh, Samuel is actually from the community of the cinema on the Tana Autumn Nation. So he'll, he'll get a chance to, we'll introduce ourselves in a little bit more detail once we start the conversation tonight. Um, so please though, wherever you are tonight, think about and acknowledge and express um, your uh, gratitude at the ancestral lands of the groups that you're on across the country here. So um, take a moment to pause and reflect. And I assume that many of you have been to the cafes before. Um, we definitely want to honor uh, the Smith family. The Smith family uh, has the living trust that's uh, supporting the cafe. And it's been nice. Uh, Jay Smith is an important volunteer around here. And as we've actually been able to see her around the office, uh, the COVID shots are starting to um, get us out on the uh, on the land again. So uh, thank you uh, to the entire Smith family, though, for their support. So you can see the title on the screen there, and we'll just jump right into things. Um, this was Sells Red Pottery, a marker of Tawn Autumn identity in late pre-contact times. We'll be a little more archaeological, um, probably, than ethnographic. It has been a tough year to be ethnographic, um, but uh, Samuel has a lot of contacts and, and uh, information to bring um, that will be an ethnographic uh, perspective tonight, too. And really, this is about uh, the story of a <clears throat> small project. Um, it is a grant from the Carol B. Martin Research Fund of the Arizona Archaeological and Historical uh, Society that was awarded to Mary Ownby of the uh, firm Desert Archaeology. And both Archaeology Southwest and Desert Archaeology have added uh, additional uh, $5,000 contribution to that project. So um, for any of those of you who are out there in the CRM world and have been running million dollar projects, uh, you're not going to see the results of a million dollar project tonight. Um, but it's for the micro project that it is, I think there's a really, we've had a lot of fun doing it. We've worked with a lot of good volunteers and uh, I hope that uh, you have some enjoyment with what we have to share tonight. And um, I like to <clears throat> sort of say that this is really about, uh, it's the story of a very special place, a mountain, uh, a peak called Baba Kivri on the Don Autumn uh, Reservation uh, southwest of Tucson. And we're going to use a number of, of images uh, through the course of the presentation by Don Autumn uh, <clears throat> artist, Michael Chiago. And while the images themselves address kind of traditional lifeways of the Ton um, people. Each of the ones tonight will have a view in the background of the Baba Kivri Peak. So you can see it here uh, in the background on, on the screen here, among or uh, behind all the saguaro gathering uh, folks in the foreground. So I <clears throat> want to just briefly introduce ourselves and then uh, we'll get into the, the presentation tonight. So 
Again, I'm Bill Doley, the president and actually the founder of Archaeology Southwest. And one way back in the mid 1970s, um, I worked with a, a Otham woman, uh, Tan Otham woman named uh, Juanita Ahil, um, and um, learning the ways in which uh, she gathered various wild plants, particularly saguaro and mesquite. And the very first project that Archaeology Southwest did as a, as a new organization in 1982 was um, out on the Tonawatom Reservation at the community of, of Nolik. So it's a very special place in my um, past and I've had a great time and, and honored to uh, have been able to work with um, Samuel Fiont uh, over the course of the, the past year and a half or so. And the goal tonight is to, you know, share the, <clears throat> how our preservation archaeology mission um, connects to the theme of the, of the cafes this year. We prioritize uh, tribal collaboration. We use low impact research methods. Uh, we use a lot of existing data. Um, you'll see how some new technologies are applied uh, tonight. And the field work that Samuel and I have been doing has been totally non-collection. So um, the really interesting sort of uh, final result, though, I think is that we'll be trying to demonstrate and show that the Baba Kivari peak um, has a very deep connection in uh, Tana Autumn identity and that this pottery type actually helps make that story um, apparent. And it meshes with other kinds of um, information and evidence as well. So I'm gonna let um, Samuel uh, take the mic over here and we'll be going back and forth. And I've said that Samuel jump in anytime. So we may interrupt each other from time to time, um, but Samuel, thank you for coming in tonight and uh, welcome. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think, uh, I think you guys can hear me. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, good. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Fayant. I'm a member of the Don Autumn Nation. I work for the Don Autumn Nation uh, Culture Affairs Program. My title is uh, the uh, Culture Affairs Specialist for the Cultural Center where we have our uh, office located. Um, really my, my project, my, my funding source comes from the uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Program, which is under the, the um, Parks and Recs Department. So I'm really basically on a year to year uh, uh, contract with them, basically. So hopefully, uh, It'll keep going and I'll be uh, employed through the rest of my time here. So again, I, and again, I really appreciate uh, being out in the field and uh, working with uh, Bill, because again, like we say, this is a um, learning experience. So for myself, uh, Bill has really opened up and it showed me or taught me the knowledge that he has with uh, the South Red that we're gonna talk about tonight and some of the areas that um, I really have not really seen or, or gotten a chance to really visit until recently. And that was really a uh, eye opening experience for me and really connects back to our ancestors and where they lived and so forth and trying to figure things out as we go along as to how things came to be or how they lived and so forth. So this map right here shows our uh, Aborig Aboriginal lands and in the center here is uh, where our uh, nation is located now. This is Centibere on this side and uh, up on this side towards the west. Uh, and again, it, it's broken down into three parts and for myself looking at this map, you know, we traveled freely 
to and fro, you know, so it really wasn't really a set area because we went down to the ocean to collect uh, the seashells out here in the Gulf of California. And also down towards the San Pedro River, we went to go collect and harvest the uh, acorn in the area. So on the map, it shows that uh, we are in the center, Akchin or Desert Autumn. And uh, on the <clears throat> left, if you're looking at the map, is the Hiachid Autumn uh, area and the uh, sobriety on the right side of the screen. And again, our land w went all the way down south into, into which is now Mexico, down to far, about as far as uh, Hermosillo and all the way up north to which we call our relatives, the Akimura Autumn, which are the, as they are called back in the day, the Pimas. But we're related, we speak the same language, we have to share the same customs, we share the same um, ancestors and so forth. So they are, we just, I just call them our relatives from the north. And right now, uh, I think that's what the things that we need to do as looking at, uh, could you go on to the next slide and show our district boundaries here? As I said, this is our boundaries here. This is Senebir up in the Tucson area where we're at now. And that's the furthest to us towards the east. And there's a little one up here in it's called San Lucy, which is furthest to the west. And uh, another village up towards the north uh, is Florence community, but they're all tied into uh, the main part of our reservation because again, this is, we're divided into 11 political districts. And the way that the districts were created was that they were just a means of a fencing off area for the cattle. So the cattle won't be roaming into somebody else's district or somebody else's community. And they kind of kept them in check. But as a result of that, then we started taking ownership of our districts and say, well, this is my district here. You know, what are, if I came from, let's say, um, again, as, as Bill mentioned, I'm from uh, the village of Pacinimo here. If I went up to Hikuan district, then they would question, well, what are you doing over here? You know, how come you didn't go to the district office and uh, got permission to be out here, that kind of thing, you know? So the district unfortunately kind of separated us too as well as the Mexican border down south here because we still have uh, relatives and villages that live in the villages south into Mexico. So we have uh, issues, like I said, you know, we have to abide not by just by tribal laws, but since we're in the state of Arizona, we have to abide by state laws. And since we're under the federal jurisdiction of BIA, we have to abide by federal governments. So it's a very intense uh, political arena that we live in, but uh, you know, I don't want to get into that now for, so that's all I have for that. This was taken uh, this past winter and you see uh, the Babakiri Peak here, the Babakiri Mountain Range. And in our culture, in our stories, we say that Wau Giorg, as we call it here, uh, Baba Kibri, that is where our creator Iitai lives. He lives in a cave over here in the, the base of the mound here, the peak here. And we still go up there and uh, offer ceremonies, prayers for, you know, basically to, for the better, betterment of our community members and also the world, around the world. And uh, we still believe in our creator the Iitoi and uh, we still offer prayers for him. And like in the past, you know, that we say that while Georg is a sacred mount for us and that's why we wanna keep it that way. We wanna honor our past, our traditions, keep uh, the memory of our culture in, into our history and our culture and teaching it to the younger generations as they move on. Uh, this is the center, our, they call it our Himdaki uh, Culture Center Museum, which is down at the, in a village of Tepawa. And um, 
if you have a, you know, I think right now it's shut down because of the COVID issue or pandemic, I should say. But uh, I think once things are under control, COVID is under control, control, then they'll open up the facility again and it's open for anybody to come in and visit our museum and check out our, our center here. Again, so that's all I have for that thing. Again, these were taken from a guy by the name of Bernard Sequeiros. So we're gonna um, ask a question here. Uh, Samuel has raised the importance of uh, Baba Kiwiri. I wish I could pronounce it as well as he does um, and correctly. Um, but what is it that these pieces of pottery here, there are actually two views of the same um, uh, shirt, um, and they're examples of cells red. You'll see some more as we go through, um, but I'm gonna close down this for just a second here. Um, the really distinctive aspects of cells red are A, their red color, um, and B, the patterned polishing that you see on it. So up by the rim here, you have this little back and forth parallel to the rim. Uh, so they've polished parallel to the rim and then just a little bit below the rim, they change directions and it's, it's um, perpendicular to the rim. And you're looking on the right-hand side on the interior of the vessel. You're looking over here on the left side on the exterior. It's a little less obvious the parallels to the rim here, but that's what's going on. And then they switch directions and it's um, uh, perpendicular to the rim. So in many ways, cells red is very easy to, they're, they're a little bit subtle, but it's fairly easy to um, identify and see. Um, but, you know, I guess the question of, um, let's ask Samuel to share a material indicator of on autumn identity today, and we've sort of picked this man in the maze basket and uh, design. So, Samuel, you want to jump in? Yes, yeah, sure. So, this, uh, as they call this, the man in the maze uh, a basket. And for us, you know, it, it represents, uh, I've heard it being referred to as Itoiki or Itoi's house. And it represents yeah. uh, you as the person coming into life and going through the maze, which is part of the journey of life and all your struggles and so forth as you're going through um, the different um, years of your life, I should say, from when you were a child into puberty, into a young man, into being an adult life until you come into the center where you become an elder and you start contemplating the journeys that you've gone through or start sharing some of the, the history or the culture that learned, you've learned along the way. And when you come into the center that say that's uh, when you are done with your life and it's time for you to go back into the spirit world. And our relatives, the, um, the Akhmadatam, they'll say, you start off in the center. You start in the center and make your journey through the life. And as you go to the edge, you go out into the spirit world. So there's two perspectives here. And again, like we say, you know, there, there's uh, different areas on the nation that have different stories for different, uh, um, let's say winter stories, stories that tell of creation. One side will have a different version, other side a, another version, but it's the same thing. It's just the locations that are different. Or like we say in, in our language too, there are about uh, five dialects. So again, the words changes too, but they, the meaning stays the same. So I just want to share that with you. So I thank you for that. That's fascinating. I was not aware that the uh, Aki Melon Tana Autumn had different uh, starting points and ending points. Thank you very much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, a, a basket um, is something that would be um, not 
preserved if it's out on the landscape, like a, on an archaeological site. Um, and so we're going to, excuse me, I'm having trouble with my <clears throat> controls down at the bottom there. Um, this is a close up of a shirt um, that's highly eroded on the inside of a, of a big um, jar. And it reveals the sand temper that the potter brought to the clay and worked into the clay. When the clay is fired, it adds strength to the, the vessel so it can withstand the heating and cooling that it goes, may go through on a fire and that sort of thing. So uh, sand temper is a very common thing in the, in the pottery of the Southern Southwest in particular here. And on the right is a <clears throat> little uh, even close up. So this little white piece here is uh, that little arced white piece there. So you're just seeing the, the detail even closer. Um, I, you notice I said a petrogra petrographer examines sand temper. Um, the sand that is in a wash um, actually reflects the um, mountain. Um, or the higher elevation um, sources of the where the sand has been kind of worked over with um, th through being tumbled over rocks and, and uh, crunched together and so on. So um, there's a really distinctive signature of uh, the sands from a different place. And it comes from the mixing together of places uh, in the mountain. And uh, so a petrographer um, and our petrographer is my Mary Ownby uh, from Desert Archaeology. And uh, with, working with um, ceramicist uh, Jim Heibke, former petrographer at Desert, um, Beth Mixa, um, they've developed understandings of, of, generally speaking, a potter isn't going to walk too far to get sand to add to clay. I mean, most places, um, it's not that far to the nearest wash. And um, oftentimes the sands of one wash are roughly equivalent to the sands of another. So, um, but interestingly, um, and we're gonna jump into uh, some of the research that, that uh, Mary has done. This is the, the kind of the first map of the <clears throat> area starting in Tucson and going west out onto the reservation. Um, that was part of the grant submittal to the Arche Archaeological and Historical Society. And so Mary had done some work and uh, identified the, a, a cell's red piece of pottery from the site of Zanardelli on the south side of Tucson. And she'd also done some work um, from Jackrabbit out on the Ton Autumn Reservation. And the two cell's red um, cases looked like they had the same temper. Um, and <clears throat> the interesting thing, though, was that the temper didn't match um, the area where the piece of pottery had come from out there. It matched, as she, a geologist, Dr. Uh, Gordon Haxel, had um, done a study of the Baba Kivari range, uh, again, just to the east and south of uh, where this jackrabbit site is. And there was a good match um, and the west slope of the Baba Kivari peak uh, for the kinds of sands that she was finding in the sherds from jackrabbit and mat which was a match to Zanardelli. So that got the kind of the thinking going that, oh, um, they're not using local sands. They're using sands from a place that's uh, today very important to the Ton Autumn. Um, could there be something more to, you know, behind this relationship? So, um, and another source of information um, that we that sort of helped guide the thinking on this project. Um, Back in the early uh, 2014, I think to 2017 is the time range. Um, this guy in the orange shirt back here, Louis Bork, was a preservation fellow with Archaeology Southwest, and he 
implemented the um, Edge of Salado project, which involved some um, <clears throat> limited excavations in these um, sites with small platform mounds out in the Coyote Mountains, just a little bit east of where um, Jackrabbit is, and a little bit east from the boundary, eastern boundary of the Ton Autumn Reservation. But one of the key issues there was were people in the Western Desert, in the um, referred to as often as Papagaria, were they um, buying into, were they accepting the, um, what was being referred to as a new ideology or a, a religion tied in with Salado? And Lewis's work showed fairly strongly that no, um, their Salado is actually not even strong, that strongly represented in Southern Tucson area and even less so out in the uh, area by Coyote Mountains and, and westward. So the idea of um, competing idea, ideas and ideologies back in this day was another uh, thing that we brought to this, um, the questions. And this also uh, served as an important source of the cells red pottery. This is, is the, um, Samuel mentioned uh, Bernard Sequeiros as the photographer of um, Baba Kibri uh, in the earlier. This is a, a team of, of um, John Autumn advisors that were involved in that project out next to a series of, of large um, <clears throat> uh, bedrock mortars there in, in the Coyote Mountains talking about the, the project and, and so on um, back in the day. So I'm going to leave this um, slide on methods and just um, we'll see some slides that address these issues. But the other sources of information related to cells red and uh, early archaeology out on the Ton Autumn Reservation are strongly tied to uh, the second director of the Arizona State Museum, uh, Emil Howry, arrived there in 1938 and began his so-called Papagoria project. And uh, there were uh, he and his students did a lot of survey out on the what's the modern res reservation. Uh, they identified sites, they made small collections of, from those sites, and they were trying to understand the landscape out there. And there were two um, excavations um, a little east and south of, of cells out there, one at, at um, a place called Balshni Village and another at Jackrabbit both of which resulted in master's thesis. And then farther to the west, uh, people have probably may well have heard of um, Ventana Cave. That was the third of the major excavations that were reported on. So another of the key uh, sources of information for this project was the Ameren Foundation back in the early 1950s had done some excavation at a site called Palo Parado down near uh, Tumacacri Mission on the, on the Santa Cruz up, up uh, stream from uh, <clears throat> Tucson. So we went to the State Museum and, uh, and tapped into those collections. I'm going to show you the, the um, site of Jackrabbit first. And <clears throat> on the screen here, um, this little circular inset is a small platform mound that um, Frederick uh, Scantling, the master's student that did the excavation here, um, <clears throat> on, the, on the ground surface, he saw a, a low mound that was almost six feet high. Um, it was about 80 feet across. And a trench across it showed up these really heavy um, meter, meter and a half, um, so three to three and a half, four feet uh, thick adobe walls. And he thought he had a big room. He emptied out everything in the middle out. And he was scratching his head. Why is it that the only the exterior walls are, are plastered? The interior walls, if it was a place where people were living, um, weren't. Well, 
he had taken the fill out of what we would today call a platform mound. That's how you build a platform mound. You make an adobe um, rectangle or square, fill it with fill, and, and you have a nice raised surface. They're, they're um, uh, generally um, viewed as uh, ceremonial um, structures within a village. Um, so when Samuel and I went out to Jackrabbit, um, we've been out there a couple of times, um, I took this photograph standing right in the middle of this feature and what you're seeing as raised area there is actually the back dirt that was um, never backfilled uh, and left on the ground. So there's a, there's a sense of where this was out there, um, but that excavation um, was never, never backfilled, but it was an important piece of information from that um, mound, this shell trumpet was recovered and this spire or the pointed end here uh, has been ground off. And so it, this is actually a trumpet that, um, and the, um, I honestly don't know if you can see the citation at the bottom, um, the Arizona State Museum has a whole series of different images of this um, <clears throat> shell trumpet online in their um, curator's choice um, uh, little feature and it's a wonderful exhibit so if you want to see more of that this this trumpet is about seven and a half inches long as it says there um, what we've seen walking over the site um, are lots of um, many times large pieces of cells red pottery this one's about seven inches across. Um, <clears throat> another one where the interior of a, of a bowl is the striations are showing clearly. And Samuel, we've, um, you've communicated with some of the local folks out there at, at um, Ali Chukson or Little Tucson. You wanna share some of their thoughts and experiences? Yeah, um, before I get into that, I just something just popped in my head and uh, let me share that with you. But again, going back to the pottery or the cells red is again, I remember visiting a site up in um, um, the, what we call um, down in the Cabeza place called Charlie Bell Well and there's about um, just a hill full of uh, petroglyphs and uh, uh, our guys uh, Rick and Sandy Marnick you know was asking our the people that went into the to visit the site you know what they perceived from some of the petroglyphs what they thought it represented and there was a number that showed the lines coming down like that and we said probably it represents rain rain coming down. Hmm. So I'm thinking, well, maybe if this was used for a ceremonial pot or use ceremony, maybe that represented the rain coming down. And again, like I said, it's it just ideas. It's just thoughts mm -hmm. that we come across as we start learning about these things. But going back to Jack Rabbit, you know, and I thank Bill for taking me out there because I've heard of it, but this was the first time I've actually saw it and it, it's a very powerful place, you know. And um, we had uh, two site visits there. One, the first time we went up there, one of the community members who's a hunter and the family still um, goes out to the barbecue Mountain Range to, um, you know, uh, herd their cattle or get their cattle out there from the area. And he said that, you know, the nation has uh, an equipped program under um, uh, that provides, you know, uh, the ranchers their funding, a funding source to have them uh, build basically uh, like uh, open uh, areas where they can fence in the area and uh, place uh, their cattle or horses in the area. And he said he was thinking about putting it right here in the in the Jack Rabbit ruins. Because at that time he didn't know about it, that 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 uh, jackrabbit existed in the area, 
So when he saw it, I said, I, I, I'm going to change my mind. This is not where we're going to put the, the equip. We're going to put it a different place. So that's a positive thing because again, we need to start, um, you know, identifying these sites and figure out a way how we're going to preserve them for our future generation. And he also told me that, or told us that back when people were living there in the area, or he remembers um, that there was a spring that ran from the Baba Kiwi Mountain Range down into towards Little Tucson, right next to Jackrabbit. So the people that lived there knew that, oh, this is where the water source is. This is where we're going to build our our homes and the water source is going to be nearby. But unfortunately, with uh, the way that uh, the world is happening here with the global changes and so forth, and I think back in the day, there was a lot of rain which plenished the groundwater or the springs and they flowed freely. But now that we haven't had that much rain, unfortunately, a lot of them are, have dried up and the same way with the San Juan Spring. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to share that with you. So thank you. No, that was very uh, wonderful visit that we had with um, to hear his his stories out there. And it sounds like we did some preservation archaeology just about by accident that day. We like to do it intentionally, but yeah, <laughs> it worked well that day. Um, just going to run real quickly through. So once people got um, you know trained, uh, recognizing the um, cells red pottery. Um, was relatively straightforward. And we worked with the State Museum to um, get access to collections from about 100 sites on the reservation and, and on the uh, Altar Valley, uh, which is immediately southwest of Tucson and immediately east of the um, reservation. And we used uh, volunteers. Um, Elizabeth Burt is in this photograph, and uh, Joyce Clark actually wrote, drove down um, for our museum days from Phoenix. So um, worked through those ceramics um, and divided them basically into um, definite cells red, and that was what, what our target was, and then other uh, plain and, and, and painted wares. So it was a um, very productive um, process. And Jim Heidke of Desert Archaeology, um, A was the kind of uh, quality control. He confirmed that yes, this indeed is a diagnostic cells red. And he also looked at the temper under his microscope um, to see kind of make a uh, preliminary assessment of how much variability there is in the material. And to get out to um, the Ameren Foundation, Sarah Hur and I went out on a Saturday. Uh, greatly, great, we're grateful to Eric Caldwell. The, uh, <clears throat> I think he was either the new um, executive director or, or just um, the, I think he was when we got out there. So anyway, um, Thanks to Eric for letting us in on a Saturday, and we went through, and Sarah went through the shirts out there to uh, designate uh, a large collection of, of uh, cells red from that uh, Palo Parado site down on the Santa Cruz. One other kind of data collection: um, Mary Ownby uses her petrographic scope both to look at thin sections of, of uh, pottery shirts, and she also. Um, gets set into a resin um, samples of sand so that she can actually treat uh, the sands like uh, all, almost equivalent to a sherd. And so Samuel was out um, just a week and a half ago, I think, um, with Mary and accompanying her on a sand collecting trip. And they're taking the first um, shovels of, of the sand, putting it on a plastic um, Bat or a cloth like that so that you can get a diversity of things and mix them together. And then that's run through a geolog geological sieve here uh, to sort out the stuff that's coarser than sand size and bagged up in a, in a bag. Um, and that will later be cleaned and, and uh, Mary's going to continue some additional studies of the sand out there at the base of Baba Kivari. And <clears throat> 
just, I thought this was a great little photo. Um, Mats Merman, who's a potter here in Tucson, uh, and Samuel um, <clears throat> aren't as tall as a, as a barrel cactus out there in the <laughs> desert at the base of Baba Kivari. So how was that terrain out there? Was that um, hard to get around in this area that we're thinking the sand was being sampled? Yeah, it, it was very rough because a uh, lot of the, the trails or the road that we followed, uh, a lot of them, like I mentioned earlier, the, the ranchers go out there to uh, check on their cattle and uh, some of the, the, what they call uh, the uh, charcoals or the water mm -hmm. ponds out there to make sure that they have enough water into the area for their cattle. So they're the ones, main ones that used uh, the roads, but they were used uh, back in the day for uh, all of them that went out to go harvest uh, the swirl fruit, which was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, they would uh, only travel or on, uh, on wagons or on horses. So basically a lot of times we would follow trails that were uh, uh, wagon trails that started out as wagon trails. And and when you go from uh, north to south on the Baba Kiri Range, there's a main road that, that goes across and they call that the San Juan Trail. And there's a not, number of uh, historic uh, ranchers that we saw in the area. And the train is very steep. So you're like going up and down, up and down into the wash areas that were, were um, that they're collecting the sand. And I was uh, joking with Mary, you know, we'd come down to the big wash and I was like, uh, what about this area, Mary? They look good enough? And she's like, no, I'm very particular as to where the sand I'm gonna get. So we just keep going. Okay, well, and then we'll keep on going, keep on going. So it, it was very rough. And uh, on the last day when we uh, finished with the collection and we, um, cause we used one of our, our trucks that we use for our program there. I drove the truck back to our office there at the Culture Center Museum or the Himalaki and went inside and we talked with Peter and then we came back out and noticed that we had a flat tire because the truck, <laughs> the rocky roads out there, I guess punctured the tire. And then unfortunately, you know, we, good thing that we're, it didn't happen when we're out there, you know, we'd be, and not having to be walking, walking back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a very rough area. Well, we've kind of showed you all of the information sources and and what comes together. Um, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time here with these maps and and kind of try to put it together. Um, so first off, here's Tucson. Um, this light area um, that's orangish um, is the reservation. Uh, we've talked about sort of the high density areas. This is uh, places where the pottery density of, of uh, frequency of cells red is 50% or higher. Um, so there's this high, really high frequency zone out there. Cells as a com modern community is right where my arrow is, if you can see that. Um, the <clears throat> dotted line around the exterior was our initial um, assessment of where we thought the extent of cells red was as a common pottery type. Um, we actually modified that and updated our map um, with this dashed red line now. Um, the red stars out here are, are places that weren't um, in our sample, but there's sites where there were um, excavations and they helped us um, sort of plot the overall distribution. But the really important stuff is that um, all those green little boxes here are places that from the State Museum collections and from the Ameren Foundation collections, we were take, able to get Mary some thin sections to study. And uh, the big green star right in the middle of things here, that's the Baba Kivari sand zone that um, they just got back from taking their most recent set of sand samples from. So this is kind of the geography there. Um, and this from the far west to the far east over here, this is the San Pedro River. This is uh, basically Fort Huachuca and Sierra Vista over here on the east end. And this is Oregon Pipe Cactus National 
monument out on the far west. So 150 uh, miles uh, from east to west is, uh, is the extent of uh, the cells read here. Um, here's the results of Mary's work. Um, those 75 sherds that she looked at as thin sections, 73 of those actually match up. And so all these um, little green circles here are places, remember in the very first map, we just had Jackrabbit and um, the site of Zanardelli over here on the Santa Cruz. So we've expanded that evidence of this same temper is being used in the cells red in all these places across this landscape that have the green dots there. And these are the two pieces of pottery that didn't have the right sand in them. So it's not that they don't exist, but they're, they're kind of off on the margins of the distribution there. And uh, so jumping into one more layer of information on the map here, um, these sites that Samuel and I have been visiting are, um, they tend to be large and impressive. So all those big red dots on the screen are these large villages that have lots of cells red on them. So I think that's the other key piece of information that we've accumulated so far. And I know that Samuel knows of some other sites that are out there and we didn't, some sites um, we haven't even tried to get to yet. So um, there's more uh, work to do, but the pattern is you know, starting to emerge from where we are now. And I wanna kind of jump to um, sort of a, a wrap up here. So we'll have some time for questions, but, uh, yeah, once again, I forgot to mention um, the time range for, for cells red is basically uh, still not adequately resolved, but it's, it, it's on the order of 200 to 225 years uh, from 1225 to 1450. So it's a late time period and a late pottery type. Um, and you've, we've just gone through the maps there. Um, I think trying to put this in the context of the people on the, what's now the, the Taunatam Reservation and, and uh, the Coyote Mountain area were clearly um, not buying in at all to Salado. They were buying in very gently to um, the kind of the pottery and the, the um, ceremony architecture of the Tucson Basin. There are a few platform mounds, but most of those big villages we saw didn't have platform mounds. Um, Salado polychromes, all of the excavation at, done at, at um, Jackrabbit produced only five pieces of, of um, Salado polychrome. So again, that the evidence for the Salado um, identity being adopted out there is like, no, they aren't. Um, another piece of information that um, again, Jim Heidke compiled while, while he was there at the State Museum, he was able to measure the uh, apertures or the openings of the, the uh, vessels that, the, that he was uh, had shirts from very high percentage, 80% of the, of the vessels are of, uh, for like serving large groups. So the idea that these were probably used for ceremonial uh, and, and or feasting um, kinds of, of undertakings uh, seems pretty strong. So um, this pottery, um, which is, you know, it, its redness is really distinctive and, and its uh, polishing is, is subtle, um, but it has in it over this entire landscape, this special hot, uh, sand temper that comes only from this one very special place. And you've seen all the images uh, from Michael Chiago. You've heard Samuel talk about how important it is as a place for the Tan Autumn today. Um, it just seems like this is a continuity um, that um, goes from at least the 1300 time frame of, of um, cells red up to relatively recent times. And this is our, our closing little um, vignette from Michael Chiago. 
Um, you know, you can change, um, you can add new elements to your, your identity. Um, the fact that you've got a Christian cross on top of this um, uh, traditional um, building, um, traditional homes, he's calling it. And then, you know, once again, that special place in the background of um, the uh, sacred mountain there. So um, I really do need to acknowledge all of our good partners here and uh, need to leave some time for um, the question and answer here. So we've gone on a little longer than I'd hoped. Um, the Mary and the receiving the, the grant from the Archaeological and Historical Society, um, Archaeology Southwest and Desert kicking in uh, some extra dollars. The cultural affairs folks, uh, not only Samuel, but Jeffrey Francisco and Peter Steer have also been um, very helpful throughout. State Museum, Ameren Foundation, um, wonderful partners in this. Um, a geologist, uh, his information was critical in putting this together. Mots you saw up there with Samuel and the cactus. And another geologist was out there that day and a guy named Eric Force. Um, again, thanks many, many times over to Samuel. Uh, Michael Chiago has authorized the use of his um, watercolors and just want to say thanks to all the partners who have made this possible and we're still not done yet. So there's lots more to do and we'll turn this over. We'll bring Linda in and, and uh, try to answer a couple of questions if there are some. Thanks, thanks, uh, Bill and Samuel. That was great. That was really very interesting. Um, there are a few questions, and um, several people are asking one in particular, and uh, just wondering what you, whether you guys can address it at all. Is okay. We've got all these um, cells, red um, pottery, you know, spread out quite a long ways, made with sands from the Babakibri area. So does that suggest that folk are making pottery there where the sands are and then trading them out? Or are people collecting the sands and then taking them back and making the pots? What, do you guys have a perspective on, do you know? Do you have an idea what that means? It's a question we definitely are, you know, torments us. <laughs> 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 What? You don't have an answer yet? <laughs> well, again, the Samuel and I went to a site um, just a week and a half or two weeks ago that was up in that foothills area, and it was supposed to have a lot of cells read, and it was like, oh, maybe there's one that is going to help us understand where the manufacturing is going on. Um, but it was a very meager, I mean, we saw a few shirts, there was a site there. So um, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I know Mary Ownby likes the idea that that you know, these uh, settlement pattern may have been by seasonal, so that maybe that in the winter season that people were making pottery up there. Or, um, but we honestly just don't know yet, and um, it's my excuse for ha having um, Samuel having to spend many more days with me as we try to answer that question. Is there some way you could get at it by looking at the paste, the, the actual clays? Is there any way to get at it beyond the temper? <laughs> the, <laughs> pausing yeah, like, you know, someone else would like, Excara would help or? Yeah, I think both possible, uh, I mean, Mary's trying to pin down a tighter signature for um, where the sands may be coming from. There's a little bit of variability up there and, and that might help um, focus uh, precisely where the sands are coming from. Second, um, I'm curious about whether the, the uh, red slip has potential for at least showing variability or not. And third, mm -hmm. yes, paste. Um, and just finding sites, there's, a lot of this pottery out there. So it, it's maybe they can make it. 
by being invisible on the land, but I'm, I'm dubious. There has to be some kind of a signature out there and we just haven't gotten, um, gotten out there to find it. And I think you did just sort of answer this. Somebody asked about is the red color a slip? And I think you did just answer that it is. <laughs> Samuel wanted to. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, remember what uh, Bill, we visited uh, the site there called uh, on the map. It was an old map called uh, Ethai Cave or yeah. Ethai Key, another <laughs> Ethai Key. And what was it like maybe 15 miles from Jack Rabbit? Yeah. Or 20 miles, something like that. And I said, if it was, uh, let's say, and again, this is hypothetical, you know, what if uh, it was produced there at Jack Rabbit? Or the, the makers were, let's say, again, females, you know, that made the pot. So, uh, uh, the leader or the, the person in charge of uh, Ethai Cave, the other village over here, knew of the pot and knew it was a specific type of pot and they used for the ceremonies, let's say. So in order for him to get that manufactured in their village, he would make a deal with the leader there in Jack Rabbit say, okay, I wanna bring one of your women or marry one of your women to come to my village and then you can produce the pot over here. So again, that's the way it was with the wives, you know, they would make agreements to, or they would, back in the day, it was like the adults were the ones that made the arrangements, the marriage arrangements with the kids. So maybe the same thing happened with the potter. Maybe the potter came to the village because that was their expertise and they started making the pots there in the village. And again, just just my theory, my theory behind this. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it's interesting. Yeah. Um, is there continuity with um, historic ceramics? With um, um, and yeah, continuity with historic ceramics. Maybe is it a precursor to the historic papago red or? And could the red color be tied in with the red saguaro fruit? And <laughs> I get your red theme. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my sense is that there there is a um, break in the in the cycle there. That that um, we did in one of our um, ventures all the way out in the northwest near um, the Hikiwan um, district. Uh, or in that um, we visited a pretty early village and all the pottery there was plain. Um, and <laughs> so I, I think there's, this is a um, something that um, like many of the other kind of specialized Salado polychromes uh, last a certain length of time and then they, they um, no longer are being made. I think that actually is gonna be what we find applies here and that it, it, it's picking the redware pottery that's made um, since the late 1800s till today um, by Tana Atam is probably a, a renewal of a tradition, but it, it's different vessel shapes and different slip treatments and all that sort of thing. Okay, so I got another question about your sands from the other direction. Um, is there evidence that um, the Baba Kipri sands are not found in plain wares in a lot more large way? I, I wish I had a good answer to that. I mean, the um, I know that um, there's a couple of examples. There just haven't been a lot of, of um, plain wares that I'm aware of out there. Um, that have been sampled. I, I believe that's true. I believe that there's at least examples where the plainwares are a, a much better match for the local um, okay. settlement, but there isn't enough of a sample um, to um, really answer that question yet. Again, most of the Pottery that I mean, the, every shirt that you're looking at on the screen right now is is um, was collected from the surface in the 19 late 1930s, early 1940s by Howry and his um, students. So um, there 
even talking about co-associations with other pottery types is, uh, you know, there could be mixing and all that sort of thing. So there hasn't been much excavation. And so, why there's such good preservation. You probably don't have a whole lot of specific information about provenience um, in terms of in into site. Like, that you, you don't know where these things have particularly been found. No. Okay. Okay. That was another question that I was looking at here. So, <laughs> Trying to think what other see some other questions that we can answer in the last couple of minutes. Um, Samuel, this is one that's not really um, about the cell bread, but we had a, a member here who wants to know if they want to drive across the Don Odom reservation, drive around up, you know, do they need to get a permit? What you know, what kind of that, you know, what can they do? Samuel, do you okay? Um, well. Highway 86 goes from Tucson to Hawaii. Okay. And it's a lot of, there's a lot of traffic for people that go to Rocky Point. That's the main corridor using from Tucson going up that way. To come into a village, the protocol is that if you wanted to go into the area, you would have to go to the district office and get permission from the district office to before you travel in the area and they will be the ones to give you the okay or not. Let's say with the Baba Kiri, where we talked with the Baba Kiri mountain range, there's a park in the area and that's open to anybody coming in. But again, you would have to stop at the district office to get a permit from there before you went out to the, to the park. That way, again, it's just a protocol. No, you're out there. Because again, you know, uh, just to give you a warning that, you know, that since we're so close to the Mexican border that there's a lot of uh, high trafficking of narcotics going through by the cartel. And when you come into the area, you also notice that there's a lot of uh, border patrol cruising the area. So let's say you have a license plate that says, says Texas, you know, you're going to more than likely be stopped over by border patrol and says, what are you doing out here? You don't have, you're not from this area, et cetera, et cetera. So, Again, just a, just a fair warning to you guys. So thank you for that. Great. Well, and we, we'll wrap up in a second, but I have a comment from a colleague um, here at Arc Southwest. But she's just saying that she finds the, the contrast between the bold exterior Salado imagery on the feasting vessels and the subtle pattern polishing of, you know, that might relate to rain, like you were talking about on the cells bread. She finds that really compelling and just says she's looking forward to seeing more, hearing more about that from you and other other folk as you as you keep you know thinking about this some more. Yeah. So but no, I think that we've had a great time. Lots of good questions. Um, it's probably about time we should wrap it up. So I'll I'll give it back to you, Bill. Um, just to remind everybody that if there are some questions that I didn't get to, um, we'll pass those on to Samuel and Bill, and um, if they can answer some of them, they will, and we'll, we'll put them on our extended content here, which is up on the screen right now, and we'll also email you out and let you know when that stuff's up. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. As always, thank you, Samuel, for um, the good time today and all the other past times out on the res and we'll yeah. keep it going. Um, yeah. So this is our last um, cafe for the season, um, but I have some information about what's coming. So in, we were gonna stay with this, vid, uh, this uh, virtual format in 2021's fall season and uh, into the, the next. Um, and we're going to be having a focus on avian archaeology. So we're putting together a big magazine issue that's going to have a heavy focus on all of the different ways in which birds are um, represented in uh, archaeology and, and uh, the past. And so you'll, as they, um, I've said here in this little uh, 
piece that um, you'll gain greater insight into how people of the Southwest interact with, interacted with a variety of different birds from turkeys to macaws across the centuries. Um, let your mind take flight as we learn the latest research <laughs> in human avian relationships in the avian Southwest. So, um, so we'll start up in October. Uh, first, um, Tuesday in October is the 5th, I believe. So we'll be seeing you soon and uh, have a great summer. I hope there's a monsoon and we all get wet many, many times. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. Yes. Thanks again, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye,